Hello, everyone. Welcome to Group Tacos HR from Happy Valley. This podcast is coming to you from Radio SHM at Penn State. In our podcast, we'll be taking a bite out of different topics relating to HR and reporting them back to you. Through our podcast, we will have a number of different segments. Here's the news where we will be reporting news to you regarding the current headlines in HR, hot topics that will focus on intriguing or controversial topics, and the real world perspective where we will interview an industry expert. My name is Sean, an A semester senior and a co-host of The Bite, looking to break out in the events industry. This podcast is co-hosted by a number of my friends who are going to introduce themselves to you now. Hello, I'm Lauren Long, and I'm a junior majoring in hospitality. Hi, my name is Madison. Uh, I'm a senior in the hospitality management program. Hi, everyone. My name is Sabrina, and I'm a senior majoring in hospitality management. Hi, I'm Stephanie, and I'm a junior majoring in hospitality management. Stick around for our next segment, Here's the News. In this segment, Here's the News, we will be reporting on different articles within the world of HR to give you all a better look into the ever-changing landscape. Hi there, I'm Lauren Long, head of Why Everyone Should Care Desk, and with today's article of how to expand diversity in the workplace from the Wall Street Journal, you'll surely find a way to put a little love in your HR. Published January 9, 2021, and written by Lauren Weber, the article conducted an interview with civil rights lawyer Cyrus Mahiri, who spoke highly of why diversity is important in the workplace and that now is the time for businesses to change their standards. Still, it's all about picking the right person for the job, but always keep an open mind and remember it's still all about fair competition, giving people a fair shot and merit-based decisions. For businesses who want to and should be focusing on a diverse business, not only for ethical reasons, but to better your company, here are some ways you can. Instead of insourcing for that higher position, try looking outside your businesses for someone new that can add a fresh mind of creativity to the workplace. If you see that you have too many white and when, add more women or other races, religions, etc., to get more ideas to bounce off each other. And from doing that, our businesses will excel for the better. I guarantee it. Hey, Sean, what do you have today that's innovating? Hello again. I am Sean Dainty. I am the head of our innovation desk. Today's article I am bringing to you is Remote Working Will Transform Employer Benefit Offerings. This article was published on October 27, 2020 from Forbes, and the author was Rebecca Henderson. The article focuses on the changing work environment many employers are having to better understand now working from home. The article talks about how companies need to look into their benefits packages to see how they can better support their employees. The quick change to working from home has created blurred lines between professional and personal lives for many employees. Companies should look at what their current benefit packages offer by surveying current employees and see what they could do to better support them in their new working conditions. Innovative processes are emerging all across the world for employees and companies to maintain a good working condition given the current situation. The next step in that process is to now re-innovate what a company provides to their employees. Making these changes now would keep current employees happy and potentially lead to more employees wanting into this company. Madison, do you have anything you want us to watch out for? Thank you, Sean. Yeah, I do have something for you. Hi everyone, my name is Madison Chekai. My desk to speak on is things to watch out for. Sing- things that may change in your workplace that might excite you or might not. The article I looked at is called What a Biden Presidency Will Mean for Your Workplace, and it was published by INC. It talks about five things Biden is supporting and is hoping to change in his term as president. I'm not gonna speak on all five. However, I do wanna bring two to your attention. How he wants to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Some states have already put plans in place to reach the $15 minimum wage, but there is still a lot that oppose it. I would predict there to be a pretty long debate on this topic because of the inflation that will follow. Second, the Be Heard in the Workplace Act that will increase protections against sexual harassment in the workplace. This act will include extensions on the status of liability for claims, increasing the amount of time an employee has to make a claim from less than six months to more than four years. Also, if the bill becomes law, businesses will be required to hold sexual harassment training. 
as a manager, even though these aren't reality yet, you're going to want to start thinking about how your business will be able to support paying your minimum wage um, employees 15 an hour. Also start to plan how you want to train your employees to watch out for any type of sexual harassment in your workplace. Hey, Stephanie, what important news do you have for us today? Thanks for your input, Madison. I'm Stephanie Asher, the head of our important news desk. The article I'm bringing to you all today is What the Numbers Tell Us About Work Right Now, written by Rachel Feensig and published in the Wall Street Journal on December 13th, 2020. This article touches on many different topics occurring in human resources since the start of COVID-19. These topics include productivity, diversity, unemployment, and remote work. Due to the pandemic and remote work, hours have increased while simultaneously decreasing employee satisfaction. Throughout the past few months, the topic of diversity when it comes to inequality and racism has been widely talked about. Unemployment rates have also significantly increased, jumping from 3.8% in February to 13% in May. These issues that are currently going on are ones that everyone should be aware of, and we need to take a step back and figure out how to solve them. Hey, Sabrina, you have anything for the viewers to think about today? Thank you, Stephanie. Yes, I do. Hello, everyone. I'm Sabrina Locke, and I'm head of the Something to Think About desk. Today, I will be sharing about the article, I Don't Care About Job Titles, But imp Potential Employees Seem Obsessed With Them, by Maynard Webb, published on fastcompany.com on January 13th of this year. This article brings attention to the fact that a lot of employees in large companies strive to receive job titles solely because it makes them feel like they're more important to the company and hold a place of leadership. The article mentions that in the early days of Yahoo, that they did not have job titles for employees. They strive to make their employees all feel that their work was equally important to the company. And it sparks the question of, would large companies have more passionate and diligent employees throughout the entire company if they were to get rid of job titles? Or would it completely backfire from the lack of structure? Wow, thanks for your reports, everyone. I thought we all brought really interesting articles to our desks. Something that got me thinking was Madison and Sean's articles. I'm curious if the minimum wage is raised to $15 an hour, if that will have a negative impact on the benefits packages given to people in higher positions like supervisors and managers. That's a great point you brought up, Stephanie. There definitely could be some negative impacts, but some positive ones could be equally between all the employees. Yeah, that's another great point, Sabrina. On the topic of equality and diversity, an increase in minimum wage and a change in benefits packages could be used as a time to better uplift our diverse employees with a better play, place within our companies to support them financially and personally. Going off the topics of equality and diversity, I wonder if the two were more addressed in the workplace if the title, job titles wouldn't matter as much to people. Maybe people felt more accepted in the workplace in that sense, then they wouldn't feel as if jo a job title is what makes them important or if they could find their sense of leadership there. Thank you everyone for listening to our news segment. Coming up next is Hot Topics. Welcome back everyone. In this segment of our podcast, we are going to be discussing Hot Topics, which focuses on the intriguing and controversial issue of pre-employment marijuana drug testing. This segment will feature a debate between two different sides for and against pre-employment drug testing, and then a roundtable discussion between us on the podcast. But before we get into our debate, let's learn some interesting facts about it. So marijuana was officially outlawed in 1970, but in 1966, California became the first state to legalize it medically. And then in 2012, Washington and Colorado legalized it recreationally. Now today, there are 36 states which are medical and 15 recreationally. So this is a very new and evolving issue, one which needs talked about in the workplace more. So let's hear from Lauren and Maddie, who are our pre-employment drug tester debaters. Hi, I'm Lauren. And the first fact I want to make for our side of being pro-free pro drug testing is the numbers. Cannabis is the most frequently used drug among Americans. 
with an estimated 43.5 million past year users, age 12 or older and 28. Connecting to this, we also found that 18% of adults employed full-time, 21% of adults employed part-time reported using cannabis during the previous year. We also pulled from different sources and found from these numbers, we found that marijuana effects can compromise safety. Hi, I'm Maddie. With the number of Americans using marijuana, there are short-term effects of marijuana, including impaired body movement, difficulty with thinking and problem solving, memory problems, and an altered sense of time. And these effects can last the entire work shift, putting everyone at risk. A real life example of the symptoms that I described comes from cleanmeat.org. A case that involved Greg Proc and his coworker who were severely burned after Proc negligently tried to remove lids of an empty oil barrel at their place of employment, who wasn't using proper safety tools or equipment. At court, it was found that Proc was exhibiting suspicious behavior that morning, and eventually Proc admitted that he had been smoking marijuana multiple times a week after work. Yeah, that could be a really scary situation. Uh, statistics from the National Safety Control found from a study by National Institute on Drug Abuse, employees who tested positive for marijuana had 55% more industrial accidents, 85% more injuries, and 75% greater absenteeism compared to those who tested negative. Going off those statistics, Madison, I found that the Nation National Safety Council released a position statement in 2019 stating that cannabis impacts psychomotor skills and cognitive ability, and that there is no level of cannabis use that is safe or acceptable for employees who work in safety-sensitive positions. And also, the numbers of tested positive for marijuana jumped from 35% in 2016 to 71%. Thank you. Now let's hear from Sabrina and Stephanie, who are debating that there is no need for pre-employment drug testing. Hi, my name is Sabrina. Starting off with our first main argument, we want to talk about the recreational use of marijuana. I saw in a study that researchers from multiple universities surveyed their employees and their supervisors and found that marijuana use after work has no impact on job performance. Another point being that marijuana can stay in a person's system anywhere from 24 hours to a month. So you can smoke on March 1st, and if drug tested on March 31st, it is very possible to still receive a positive result. I'm Stephanie, and going off of Sabrina's point, something to consider is the comparison between the recreational use of alcohol and marijuana. For example, if you go out drinking on the weekend, it doesn't impact your job performance during the week, because the effects are out of your system. The same thing occurs with marijuana. If you smoke on the weekend, the effects will wear off by the work week. The only difference is that you will still produce a positive drug test. Moving on to our second argument, let's talk about how over time, potential employers options to choose from in the pool of potential new employees is becoming narrower and narrower. And if they're looking for someone that doesn't use marijuana at all, it's gonna become more difficult. According to an SHRM article, about 24 million Americans aged 12 and older are current users of marijuana, whether it is recreationally or for medical reasons. These numbers have significantly increased over time due to more marijuana use in the ages 26 and older. Also, marijuana is now fully legal in 16 states, not including the states that approve of medicinal marijuana. So, if a doctor prescribes a person marijuana for medicinal purposes, an employer cannot technically tell them that they are not allowed to use it while employed because it is a prescription. Pennsylvania, for example, has marijuana legalized for medicinal purposes. So would it be fair for a person that has a medical marijuana card to help with their anxiety to not be hired because of that? So finally, let's compare marijuana use to other anxiety and depression medication use. According to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the United States. Approximately 40 million adults ages 18 and over in the United States suffer from anxiety. 
And there are many different medications that can also be used recreationally like marijuana, but the difference between these and marijuana is that they can be harmful if not deadly to a person if abused. For example, people are prescribed medications such as Prozac, Lexapro, Valium, Ativan, and Xanax to help with anxiety and depression every day. People overdose from Xanax and antidepressants every day, but never from marijuana. Marijuana is being prescribed for the same reasons as Xanax or Valium prescriptions, so companies should not discriminate when employing new people against those who use marijuana for anxiety reasons in the same way they do not discriminate against those who use these other anxiety and antidepressant medications. Thank you, everyone. That wraps up our debate, and now we will engage in a roundtable discussion about our own opinions on this topic. So, everyone, do you think that there is a compromise between these two different standpoints? I think everyone made great points, but I think we can all agree that safety is still a major factor here, and that we can't get rid of drug tests completely. Yes, I agree, Lauren, that safety needs to remain an important factor in employers' decisions. However, in some job positions, I do not think that there is much of a safety risk in the workplace. For example, someone who just sits at a desk all day in their office is at very low risk of getting injured. Yeah, Sabrina, I do agree with you to an extent. Although with someone working a desk job, there is the problem of them being able to get their work done. If someone is under the influence, they tend to be less productive. I do think that in some cases, that people can become less productive when under the influence. That being said, like Sabrina and I mentioned earlier, some people use marijuana for anxiety and other mental disorders. So in some cases, this can actually increase their productivity. Great discussions, everybody. This has been our hot topic segment of the podcast. Our next section will be the real world perspective where we will be interviewing Rodrigo Buonafina, an industry expert. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We are the group Tacos, and this is the real world perspective segment of our podcast. In this segment, we will be interviewing an industry professional and seeing their perspectives on the world of HR. This is Rodrigo Buonafina. He is a Penn State grad and worked with Starwood his whole career in locations like Miami and Dallas in food and beverage, but he has also worked all over the world. Currently, he works in a boutique hotel as a food and beverage manager. So, Rodrigo, how are you today? I'm doing great. Yeah, wonderful. How about yourself? Great, great. We're glad to have you here. We're glad that we get to interview an industry professional like yourself. So, we're going to start off by going into our question and answer segment of our interview. And I'm actually going to be starting off. So, I'm Sean Dainty. I'm a senior this year in the program, and I'm excited to graduate. Uh, my question for you is, what do you think the most pressing issue in HR is today? So I think it's probably a, quite an obvious one. Uh, I think it has to do with the pandemic. Uh, it has to do with how, how we deal with what's going on. Um, you know, from everything from uh, placing people on furlough, bringing people back to work, um, how, do job, how do job scopes change? How do you have to do your jobs differently? Um, I think it's all around around this, centers around this. Yeah, and in that issue, has there been any new practices that you've seen emerged um, since the pandemic started? So this, I mean, this is this is tough. Um, so obviously I work in the Maldives. Um, so the, the practices here are completely different to most places, especially in the US. Um, but I have, I have noticed here, uh, we've moved more uh, towards having like full-time staff um, who are able to kind of do multiple job roles versus just doing one set, one set role. Uh, so I'll give as an example um, on the island we employ we employ gardeners um, who basically keep the grounds looking nice um, and and fresh. So now uh, before the pandemic we used to have various individuals who would do these kind of roles. Whereas now we have the gardeners who also have been trained to, also to do housekeeping roles, for example. So like public area attendants. So um, we slightly reduce the number of people, but each of those individuals are able to do more. So, you know, as, as business uh, fluctuates, as things change, 
uh, we have a bit more flexibility in what we can do versus sending someone home or having to bring someone in extra. Um, I think this is the, probably the biggest thing I've seen that's changing, at least here in the Maldives. Yeah, that's interesting. I never really thought about that being a way to cope with what's going on, but that's a really good and efficient way, I think, at least. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, definitely beats sending people home and then you know bring them back, sending them home. Yeah, of course. let's see if it sticks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so now I'm going to pass it over to Madison to ask her question. I'm Madison Chekai, so um, I'm a senior as well at Penn State. And so do you have any advice for graduating seniors about to enter the workforce? Okay, so this, yeah, this is a fun question. Um, I try and think about when I was a senior and what was going through my head and it's getting further and further like, away in time. Uh, but I, I think looking back, the, the biggest piece of advice I would have is to try not to think about like so short term uh, you know, not, it's not necessarily about the first job that you're going to get or the first role you're going to get. Uh, you need to try and position yourself a little bit further down the line. What is it that you want? You know, um, so going into going into into the workforce now, for example, from finding a job, um, maybe thinking about how much money you're going to make the first role isn't the way to go. You know, maybe you want to think about who who's the manager you're going to work for or what is a role going to let you learn um, so that in the next job or the job after that, you're kind of a bit bet better positioned, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, that's yeah. really good advice. Yeah, so that would be that would be my first one, and then the se the second one, uh, which maybe even is more more important, is um, uh, how do I say? Uh, I, at least definitely for me, when I went into the workforce, I was like, oh, I'm amazing. You know, I graduated from Penn State. Uh, I am so ready for this. And then you realize how you are absolutely not ready for this and how there are people who you're working with who are, I mean, they, they know so much more. They've been doing things for so much longer. Um, so I think it's kind of going into, into the workforce with a bit of humble pie. I mean, be super proud of the institution you're graduating from because Penn State is a phenomenal institution. Even in the Maldives, people know about Penn State hospitality. Um, but also to kind of remember that you're, you know, you're, you're in your early twenties, you have a long career ahead of you um, to kind of be humble and, and, and learn from people, be willing to, to learn from, from others. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Next we have Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren Long. Um, I'm a junior um, at HM and I'm also a fan of f and um, Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is kind of circling back to Sean's um, about the pandemic, but um, from your perspective, perspective, how has the pandemic changed the workplace the most? Okay, so this is like an impossible question to answer. <laughs> uh, there's so many ways to look at it. I mean, I think the industry has been, for lack of a better word, completely decimated, right? I mean, it's just been turned on its head. And everywhere, everywhere is different. Um, and everywhere is going to feel it in a different way. Um, but I think what brings everything together probably in my mind is the industry is going to have to be even more kind of uh, flexible and adaptable to change because I don't think that this pandemic is, is over, you know, uh, whether, whether this continues or whether things open up in a few, in a few months, uh, we're going to have to change how we do things. You know, it definitely from an F and B standpoint, we're already feeling that, right. Mm -hmm. uh, there are things that you cannot do anymore that before it was, it was completely fine. Um, but I'm sure, you know, it's, it's across the board. HR is the same. Uh, every, every single department in a hotel or in a restaurant or in a, in a private club is going to have to adapt um, because everything is different. And, you know, I, I, really, I really think um, we have no idea what's going to happen, right? Uh, some people may say, oh, the, you know, this is what's, what's going to happen and this is how things are going to change. But I don't think anyone knows with any real degree of certainty what is going to happen in six months or in a year. So I think the answer is we have to be flexible. We have to be adaptable um, in every facet of the industry. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, my second, um, my follow-up was, um, has anything changed um, for you um, in your workplace? For you personally? Uh, yeah, 100%. Uh, everything has changed. <laughs> so again, and it's, it's different because in the Maldives, it, it's a very different kind of work and lifestyle. Uh, but to give you a really brief background, um, 
all the all the resorts in the Maldives are on a single island. So you have one island and you have one resort, and there's nothing else on the island. So everyone who lives on the island works at the resort. And if you work at the resort, you live on the island. And everything that, that is here is for, for the resort. So with COVID, a big change has been uh, people are not able to come and go from the island as they wish. So before, after work, you know, the local, the local staff would get on a boat and in 20 minutes, they would be at home with their families. So now since we reopened in September, it's, it's basically lockdown. So if you want to go home, or if you want to go to the dentist, or if you want to go to a doctor's appointment in the capital island, uh, you can go, but when you come back, you have to quarantine for 10 days and take a PCR test before you come back into the workforce. So this is the biggest, for, for, from a managerial standpoint, this is the biggest change that I can, you know, explain really easily. Um, you know, this is, this is a big change. There, I mean, there are so, so many. I'm sure you also, you're, you're experiencing changes, um, even how you're doing classes, right? Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, so next up, we have Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm a junior. I'm also in the HM program. And I'm going to gear a little bit away from the COVID um, conversation. Um, so my question is, um, what is the biggest mistake that you've seen when it comes to the hiring process? And what were the ways that they were able to overcome it? Okay, great. Uh, that's a great, that's a really good question, actually. And I'm so happy not to talk about COVID for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, so the biggest mistake uh, that I see time and again is, and I still see it now, is there is this fascination. Uh, so especially in hospitality, um, I think there's this fascination with experience. Uh, every interview that you do, the we're always worried about the experience of the individual, the experience of the candidate. And I, I think this is, I, for me, this is such an old school way of, of, um, of recruitment and of, of hiring uh, because it's, it's important for sure, uh, but it should never be the driving factor. You know, I think we get into so many trouble, so much trouble in, in, in operations because we hire people with experience and we don't actually think about, okay, wh what about the attitude? What about, um, what, what are the goals of the individual? You, you, you can teach, you can teach skills, right? Um, but you can't train attitude as, as hard as you try training attitude is, is borderline impossible. I mean, if someone is, if someone's a difficult person, they're going to be a difficult person, you know, wh whether they try to or not, it's, it's what's going to happen. So, and, and this doesn't go, at least in my experience, this doesn't go away. So I noticed it as a student when I was trying to apply for jobs, uh, you know, oh, you need more experience or, or whatever, but I also see it still in the industry now. Uh, we want to hire, for example, a department head, you know, for a, for, for a team. Of course, you need a person who has experience and, and knows the, you know, the ins and outs of a department and how a department functions. But it should, in my opinion, that's where we get into problems is we hire a person based, basically we give this huge amount of uh, weight to experience and we don't really truly look at uh, attitude, which is, which, is, which is huge. You know, this is gonna help shape a department, an organization, a hotel. So I think this is, for me, this is the biggest mistake that we get into and continue to get into. Yeah, definitely, I completely agree. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, and finally we have Sabrina. Hi, I'm Sabrina. I'm a junior here at Penn State in hospitality. I'm also a huge food and beverage person. I've almost been working in restaurants for almost about seven years now. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> my favorite. Um, so my question for you was during these difficult times, what do you think is the best way to make work more fun for employees? Okay, so again, this is my answer is going to be very based on the Maldives, uh, as that's where I am. And as you can imagine, you know, in an enclosed environment, everyone's living on the same island. Uh, so naturally, we already have more, I think, more resources than a normal hotel to to cater to this um, to this feeling, right? To have more more fun at work. We have a team that is basically responsible for three hundred employees, and their goal is to make sure that work is fun and that. Uh, non-work time is also fun since everyone lives here. Um, to answer the question a bit more generally, I think that making work fun, it needs to happen both 
obviously now during a pandemic, but not during a pandemic, not during these crazy times, we should also be doing the same. Um, and I think the best way of doing this is uh, as a manager, and when you, when you all reach kind of manager level is yes, you need to be a manager. Yes, you need to be kind of responsible in charge, but to continue to kind of be human uh, and treat your employees as if they are humans, right? And not just your subordinates. And this, this will lend itself to having fun in the workplace. Um, you know, it's important to have that distinction between being a manager and not being a, an employee, but also you need, to, you need to work at having these really strong relationships with your team um, because this lends itself to having fun in the workplace. You know, if you're that manager that kind of comes in and sits in your office and, and does kind of execute your job description and make sure a department is running well and smoothly, but you don't really uh, give time to making things fun, um, and making sure your employees are having a good time in the workplace, then you'll run into problems. Yeah, I think that's a good point you make too. Yeah. I mean, how not fun can it be working in the Maldives? So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I mean, it's beautiful there. Also, so like, can you give an example of how you've attempted to do this as a food and beverage manager? Um, to be, so I do something a bit quirky. I actually, I do this at every job so far is once I've kind of, establish myself in a property and people know who I am, uh, I will always take a few days um, in a year and come into work, for example, as with uniform of a line level staff, and I will just shadow them for the day um, and make it very abundantly clear that I'm not in charge and that I'm just kind of, I want to see things from their perspective. So for me, this does it, this, this helps two reasons. Uh, one is a, I'm able to see what kind of what they're doing and, you know, challenges they have, but B it breaks down that manager, uh, employee relationship for a day and people can kind of be themselves a little bit more. You kind of get a little bit more out of the, out of the line level staff. Right. So even last, so last week I, I did this, um, where I came here in the Maldives, they wear something called a sarong. So it's kind of like a, it's like a, almost like a dress. It's like a piece of cloth. Instead of wearing um, trousers, it's just a, a, a round piece of cloth. So I came into work um, for, for a bartender shift, basically. I didn't tell anyone, wearing a sarong. And so that was, you know, everyone had a great time. You know, everyone's taking photos. I'm like, what's this, this crazy guy? What is he doing? But so it creates a, a cool atmosphere, I think, in the department. And the next day, I'm back. I'm wearing my normal manager outfit. Um, but having done that for one day, you know, it, Things are more, things are a bit more lighthearted and enjoyable at work. So I guess that's one small example of something that I do. That sounds fun. I'd love to see yeah. <laughs> my managers walking around in sarongs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, of course. Yeah. Thank you, Rodrigo. You answered some pretty hard heading questions from us. Um, but now we're kind of going to get into the really hard part of our interview. And that's where we're going to ask you about your favorite Penn State memories. Okay, let's see. <laughs> So favorite Penn State memories. This is, this is very hard, huh? <laughs> and it was the hardest question. Yeah, yeah this is countless. I can't think of, I can't think of, uh, I can't think of how many, there's so many. So favorite Penn State memories. Gosh, you caught me off guard. Um, what, what to do? I, so I think my, probably my best Penn State memory is the events leading up to and following uh, handing in my 430 binder. I so, feel that. I yeah. really yeah. feel that. So, I'm in 430 right now. Time. Yeah, thank you. Um, so now we're going to end this conversation the way that all Penn State um, interviews should end, I think. I think we're going to do, <laughs> do a we are chant if you're up for that. OK, fantastic. OK. <laughs> One. Two, three, we, we are. are. Penn State. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on to our podcast to let us interview you. Um, Thank you, Rodrigo, again, and thank you to everyone listening. Thank you so much for listening to our HR Tacos podcast for HM 466 with Dr. Tooth. We all enjoyed working on this project while gaining new knowledge in our industry regarding current news and hospitality, 
looking into hot topics such as pre-employment marijuana drug testing in the workplace and interviewing the industry professional, Rodrigo Buonafina. My name is Sabrina Locke and thank you again for listening. My name is Sean Dainty and it has been a pleasure speaking with you. My name is Lauren Long and we hope you enjoyed our podcast. My name is Madison Chekai. We hope that you had fun and thank you for listening. I'm Stephanie Asher and I'd like to thank you for listening. Have a great day.